Hello, and welcome to episode zero of the Good Enough Mums Club podcast, where sometimes being good enough is best. How will I ever be good enough? When will the loneliness fade? When will it fade away? Why does it have to be so tough? Hard as I try, I'll never be good enough. Just before we get started, this episode has got content warning for postnatal psychosis, depression and intrusive thoughts. Plus, we can get a little bit sweary, just in case you're listening with the littles around. Okay, so as this is the introduction episode, I think we should introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Emily Beecher. I am the writer, creator, producer... Um, and founding mother of the Good Enough Mums Club, which originally started as a musical, but we do a lot of workshops as part of our work and as part of our development. And we love the workshops because we get to talk to a lot of mums and we just realized there are so many amazing stories. Yeah, it was really important to us that the work just wasn't for the stage. So I'm Jade, I play Chantal, one of the characters in the show. I also produce the show. I'm a mum to Ray, who's nine. She's absolutely off her tits crazy. I don't know if you can hear in my accent, Em. I'm from Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> Missed that completely. I know, it's so subtle. Join us as we toddle through the highs, lows and sleep deprivation of motherhood. From working on the show, we know that there are so many stories about what it's like to be a mum, and we wanted to share some of those stories with you. So every week, we're going to initiate a new mum into the club. We'll explore the complexities and realities of modern motherhood. So whether you finish the morning school run or you've just finished off bedtime, join us as we leave our judgy pants behind and accept that sometimes being good enough is best. If you want to find out more about the musical or upcoming episodes of the podcast, or if you want to join the club, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching Good Enough Mums Club. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, rate and review wherever you listen. Okay, what we wanted to do with this episode was introduce ourselves and the Good Enough Mums Club journey so far to you lovely lot. We caught up during lockdown and with Jade in Birmingham and me in London, we obviously jumped on Zoom to catch up. Emily's daughter's with her dad, so she had a chance to relax and grab a cuppa, whereas I was trying to record this chat and oversee Ray, my daughter, learning her times tables. Fun. Um, I think we should start at the beginning, you know, how did the Good Enough Mums Club come about? So I had my daughter and I really struggled after I had her. Um, She's an amazing kid, but I just really thought that I was shit at everything. Everyone else seemed to be doing this amazing job and it sort of was a struggle for me to sort of do anything, laundry, go out of the house, you know, all of these things. And it turned out that I had postnatal depression. But for me, mine started quite late. They think that it came on some point between three months and five months postpartum. Um, And I wasn't diagnosed until 10 months. So sort of I'd been living with Maisie, raising Maisie for those 10 months, just thinking that I was awful. And I eventually went to the doctor and they sort of figured it out and put me on some meds and it was great for like six weeks. I felt like a different person. And Then at 13 months, I had a psychotic break. I basically developed postpartum psychosis. I was having intrusive thoughts. I was having really horrible visions of myself um, dying um, and had visions of hurting myself. And it got really, really scary. Um, And so I ended up going to the GP sort of in tears because I was so afraid that these sort of made up things would cross over with my real life and I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And they literally gave me some meds, called my husband to come home from work, put him on suicide watch and sent me to bed. And I slept almost nonstop for 72 hours. And then they got me into an outpatient program, a postnatal depression outpatient program. And I met this amazing psychiatrist. And so I was really cared for a huge difference. Things like my meds, i was on 50 milligrams of uh, sertraline and I ended up on 250 in two weeks. Like I was so significantly under medicated. 
And I still was struggling with like, why am I not good at this? And my therapist said, why don't you just write some stuff down? Why don't you just write out some of the things that you were struggling with? So I always say, and you've heard this before, Jade, that (laughs) I started writing on the notes app on my phone because I could like wee breastfeed and type with my thumb. (laughs) <laughs> and so that's what I started to do. Moms are the ultimate multitaskers, aren't we? Trust me. But the other thing that happened was I was so thrilled that, that there was actually something wrong with me, that I wasn't just this totally crap mom and everyone else was doing great and I sucked, that I went, like wore it like a badge of pride. I went around telling everyone, hey, there's something wrong with me. I don't suck. And what happened, what I discovered was I suddenly became the person that everybody else confessed their struggles to. And people started sharing story after story about me with like, oh, well, I've had this or I've had that and I've never told anyone or I'm really struggling with this or I I cry constantly, all of these things. And I was like, this is special. Like there's a reason women are sharing these stories and, and there's also a reason why they're ashamed of these stories So I just started collecting them. And then that combined with the writing, I knew I had to do something with it. And my background was originally as an actress and then as a producer. So I was just thinking about it. And that that's the beginnings of how the Good Enough Moms Club was born. When you first told me that story, I was just like, how brave, genuinely, I I couldn't believe how brave you are, firstly. And um, secondly, it made me, weirdly, as you said, feel better. Because I also struggled as a mum. I really felt like I had the pressure on me to be perfect at parenting because I felt like the world was really in on me. That leads really nicely into how we met. Jade and I met on Twitter. Basically, I don't even know how we found each other. Do you remember? Well, you know, they say they do everything online these days, isn't it? You get your shopping, you find your partners, you get your knickers. (laughs) <laughs> I was I was I was still at drama school um I was studying I was in my third year at Rose Bruford and it was about the September so I'd just gone into third year we were going into rehearsals for Top Girls and Emily and I were just messaging in the theatre industry both mums and she messaged me and she was like we've got a space in the um the show that I think you'd be perfect for would you like to get involved and I was like I'm really sorry I'm too early in um my third year to leave at this point but I did say to her look if anything else comes up it's it's a project I'd love to be involved with so come the February the space came available again I could have done the show for my final production at drama school and been graded off that production so I got my first job which I thought would never ever happen while I was still training at drama school which was great and scary and really exciting all at the same time so yeah that's how that happened I think the most important thing and most important part about this story is that I mean you were at drama school with a kid which is almost unheard of it's such a remarkable story of sort of triumph and (laughs) fighting for what you want thank you so much yeah so what it was September 2009 um, my mum had ended up very very poorly in hospital Um, she was in there for like a month And I'd come away from drama school for a couple of weeks. I'd already completed my first year. I'd taken two weeks out to try and organise my life. And Ned says to me, okay, why don't you defer for the next year? Because it's really important that you feel comfortable and that you've not missed out and your head's in the right space, obviously, because everyone knows drama school is so hard anyway. So my mum comes out of hospital and a few weeks later, I find out that I'm pregnant, which everyone was like, what? And they just assumed, oh, that's it then. She's dropped out of drama school anyway. She's got herself pregnant. That's that. There's no way in how Jade's going to continue with acting. And I says to everybody at the time, well, I will. I just carried on, had Ray. And then Ray was about six, seven months old. And I started getting ready to move back to London. Ray and I went back to um, to the South. I say London, it's Sidcross, so, you know, borderline. And I had to go into a completely different year. I didn't know anybody. Everybody that I went to drama school with had graduated at this point. I was very sleep deprived with a baby who was one. And I decided, nope, this is it. I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. So we went down. Basically, I studied everything that everybody else did with a child in tow. With a child in tow and the sleep deprivation of like 
toddlerhood I mean it's insane yeah um I, I couldn't do it again now not if you paid me all the money in the world I'll tell you that for free <laughs> if I'd have thought about it too much I don't think I'd have done it if I'm going to be completely honest with you but I did I just put my head down and I got on with it and I graduated I'm still working in the industry but um you can definitely tell my child went to drama school because she is so jazz handsy <laughs> and performative <laughs> <laughs> yes I get that I totally Maisie's exactly oh, the same God. from all the rehearsals so the, two, the two of them together are hilarious <laughs> no seriously all jokes aside I don't know how I did it people ask me regularly how did you complete drama school with a child and obviously all my family were in Birmingham and I knew very early on I mean God love him Ray's dad and I didn't work out and I knew it wasn't going to work out for various reasons. So I made the decision that it was going to be Ray and I from she was very, very young. And um, he's involved completely in her life, but he lives in the Midlands. So it was just Ray and I. It's weird because we both had that experience, didn't we? Because, you know, I came back to the UK. I was in, I grew up in Canada. I lived here for sort of 10 years, went back to Canada, had my daughter. And then when my marriage fell apart, I came back here with Maisie, who was just about two. And we sort of had two solid years where her dad was back in Canada 90% of the time. And so there is, and I think you can see it in both of our relationships with our daughters. There's a definite like, mini me, mummy and me kind of thing that, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> and I think f- I think one of the things that I love about doing the show is that actually all three of the producers, we have another producer, Sarah Sheed, and she's based in Leeds. Shout out Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> and Jade's obviously, you know, in Birmingham. We're all single moms. So we're all doing it with our kids and our kids are all sort of within a year of age. So when we were starting to work on the show, that was something that was really important to us. I approached Jade because we wanted to, and we were absolutely sure that every single actress in the show should be a mom. And we were struggling to find young women who were in the industry that have kids. And it's changed a lot in the last sort of five, eight years. But at the time, it was really, really tough. Oh, God, it was mad. I remember walking into the audition and I looked around at everybody and they were all at least seven, eight years older than me. They all had this great repertoire of a musical theatre career that they'd all done. You know, you may have felt that sitting in the room, but a huge number of those women had 10 year gaps on their CVs or were like, this is my first chance to do something. My kids are older now. I've stepped out of the industry for 10 years or, Mm. you know, I remember people crying in the auditions because they'd never talked about their kids. And that was one of our first questions was like, hey, tell us about your kids. Not like, who's your agent and how many famous people do you know? It was always like, tell us about your family. And I, I remember people just being like, I have always pretended that I don't have kids. And I just thought, God, that's awful that you have to kind of hide that, which is why now the show has, you know, our director is a mom, our arranger is a mom, everyone involved in the creative team, us three as producers. Yeah. It's mom, 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 mom. And we're always, that's something that we're super proud of and that we fight for. That pushes us through to the um, the point of inclusivity, Em. Yeah. It's something that you and I, hugely believe in it's massive for the whole of the good enough moms club i'm a huge believer that the more diverse the room is the better it is for everyone um but i think we last year did a rewrite of the script and i rewrote it specifically to ensure that i embedded race and class sexuality to some degree into the script so that it couldn't, I guess I always say that it couldn't be taken by a middle-aged white man and cast as a purely white middle-class show, which it was never intended to be and which we'd always had some level of some sort of diversity in the casting. But I wanted it to be so embedded in the script that it couldn't, it couldn't be erased accidentally. And I guess as we've sort of gone on, we've had so many conversations about that. And I think with this particular round of casting, with the work that we're doing now, the majority of the cast isn't white. And it makes me so happy to be able to say that. And that's obviously, you know, by design, but it's also class-wise, 
everyone in our organization is really, really different. And we made sure that we brought some working class voices on board. We're all about raising up voices that are different than our own. And if you are constantly going into the room with everyone that looks like you or sounds like you, then that's never going to happen. I have to say as well, the whole inclusivity agenda that the whole world should take on and fight for, it makes it easier because you're a token so often as um, a person who is not white. And as someone who's mixed race, my dad's um, family come from the, the Caribbean, Jamaica specifically, and my mum's family of the white Irish di- diaspora. It definitely makes a difference when you walk in a room and they call it a mask. <laughs> it's called your mask. So when you walk into a room of white people, you put on your, your white people mask to have a conversation with them and you have to put the mask on and kind of hide certain elements of yourself to make everybody in that room feel comfortable. And I don't have that mask in Good Enough Mums Club at all. There's lots of women who have similar stories to myself. They're mothers, they're women, they're actresses. And now that they're most of them are not from the white diaspora, it makes it so great that I can just go in that room and be like, hey, this is me. It was a safe space and it's much safer the spaces and and it needs to be like that 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 spaces are welcoming for people from non-white traditional British middle class backgrounds to be able to be who they are I mean I'm thrilled to hear you say that 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 for me is absolutely brilliant and I think it doesn't just have to be about the room I think it also has to be with the people that we talk to yes and I guess we've always done that haven't we we've always gone into the community so Because for me, the show is literally a collection of other women's stories. I didn't make up the things that happen in the show. They are real things that happened to real people. And I've put them together and interwoven them. Yeah. And as a result, because of that, we decided, okay, so if we're going to be doing that, we need to actively seek out those different spaces, have conversations with people from very different backgrounds, so that the stories that we're collecting are not being altered to fit that world they are of that world does that make sense what I'm saying yeah for sure last year do you you want to talk a little bit about some of the amazing workshops we did last year before we did the rewrite oh yeah we were so blessed people opened up their hearts and their spaces and their communities to us the one that always springs to mind is when we went to the mosque so um, I'm from inner city Birmingham an area called Borsal Heath B12 shout out And um, we went into a mosque in that area and the stories, oh, for for one, can we just say they they fed us from the second we got in They were amazing. (laughs) It was a great experience. But their stories were so diverse and so um, interesting. They were so welcoming. I felt so welcomed and invited into their space. I'd say what was really interesting was the um, the Grenfell group that we met with. Yeah, so we met with a group of mums that sort of live in the shadow of Grenfell. Um, it was set up for us by the uh, amazing Chicken Shed Theatre group. So it's the kids, it was the mums of the kids who do Chicken Shed. And that was a, that was a script changing workshop. I mm. literally rewrote one of the characters based on one of the mums that we met there. But it was amazing because uh, I did the workshop with Hannah, our director. And so we were the only white people in the room and it was a super great mix of people that were sort of first and second generation immigrants from different places, people who'd had really different backgrounds. And it was just really, really lovely to have sort of really honest conversations of what the challenges they face raising their children. And I always say, you know, we all have the same number one challenges. We have to keep our kids alive. That's like our number one job above and beyond everything else. But different people have different struggles with just trying to do even that. Um, And that was such an incredible and inspiring group of women who spoke so openly with me. And, you know, people don't have to do that when we go into a workshop. It's it's available to them. It's hopefully a two-way conversation. That one was amazing just because of how honest they were. And this one mom in particular who shared a devastating story with us that ended up becoming a new storyline in the show. I just felt really honoured to, 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 to be able to go into them spaces and hear those conversations off these amazing women. I think that's how I feel about all the workshops. Like every time, or even when we do a show and someone comes up to you after the show and it's like, oh, I've never told someone this, or I feel really awful about that. And 
I just, I, I get that you, I get that you get it. I guess that's kind of, for me, one of the things that the show sort of hopefully says to people is a, you're not alone. B, you don't have to be perfect, but also like, we get it. We get that it's, well, that's one of your lines, isn't it? I think it's actually, I'm quoting the show. I think it's one of your lines. It's like, we get it. It's tough. It's a tough gig. So on, on, on topic, actually, we've got, we've got a couple of questions that we're meant to ask each other. Well, speaking oh, yes. of the hardest part of being a mother, what would you say you struggle with most, Em? Oh, God, can all of it be my answer? Um, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know what, it's the relentlessness. And I think lockdown has made this 800 million times worse than it normally is, is that, you know, yes, you're usually on full time, but it's the relentlessness. It never stops. And in lockdown, you know, usually if she's at school, I only have to kind of make two meals a day, but in lockdown, it's three meals a day. And it's like, oh, I've got to teach you three fronted and verbal. Sometimes four, sometimes five, depending on how much they're growing. Jesus. Eight million snacks. Can we just say shout out Marcus Rashford? for the free school meals campaign because it is hard feeding these little unemployed people in my house right about now. Can I just say that? Yeah. But you know, I think the hardest thing for me about motherhood is relentlessness. I just think Mm. it doesn't stop lockdown. That's worse. You know, it's like when you get touched out when Maisie's constantly tapping me on the shoulder and it like makes me want to explode, like turn into the incredible Hulk. Like if you've, or those toys, you know, where you like, everybody has to try and press the button and does it explode? That's me a lot of the time. Like if you tap me one more time, I'm going to lose my ever loving mind. And I mean, I, um, I love TikTok, but if she, if my child does some sort of <laughs> shuffly ja- ja- dance in front of me, for the 90th time and I, you have to smile along and, and you, you I am interested I love you so much I really do but I cannot watch you do that dance again I'm really sorry I just can't. so is it what so what is your hardest part oh my god constant guilt I've never been made to feel so guilty by someone that I do so much for <laughs> get that totally get that. literally I could buy her everything I could do everything I could sit with her for four hours I could do the TikTok dances I can you know FaceTime group chats with her friends this is just now generally speaking and it's never enough it's always like so what are we doing next I'm sitting down with a cup of tea bab what are you doing that's what I feel like <laughs> my favorite is you never do anything for me <gasps> Oh, it's really, Ooh. really, really just after I've cleaned the kitchen that you've made slime in and like, oh, that one always gets me. Mm. So the guilt and um, I suppose it's like you do, you learn to be, you like, yes, it does turn on and yes, this maternal instinct kicks in, but there's the selflessness. Do you know what I mean? You never realize just how selfish you were as a human until you have to care about somebody else all the time more before yourself. Yeah. And I suppose that's been one of the good, the things that I've had to really learn to balance. I suppose the gym has been huge in that for me. Um, I have to have me time. Yeah. I'm still a person. And I think that, I'll be honest with you, that was one of the biggest reasons I went back to drama school when people were asking me, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I says, look, I can't not have Ray. That wasn't an option. And I can't not be an actor because if I have Ray and don't become an actor, I'll resent her for the rest of my life. If I become an actor and don't have Ray, I'll resent the industry for the rest of my life. So I just have to make it work. I'm really sorry. So yeah, I yeah. would say definitely like learning to be selfish because the selflessness will take over. I think too, like I, I will put myself in time out and she'll be like, what? And I'll be like, no, I just need 10 minutes. But yeah, I just, sometimes you need to be like, mommy needs a time out. Mommy needs a break and mommy needs to not see your face for a little while in the nicest possible way. And just kind of put myself in my room and just breathe. So obviously we have the musical that we've created and we're in the process of sort of getting ready to exciting things with that, but we've added the podcast because we want to be able to reach more people. And I just wonder what do you hope that mums take away from both the show, but also from listening to the podcast? 
Well, the podcast kind of feels like an extension of the workshops, doesn't it? Yeah. The workshops seemed so important in themselves, and it was such a shame that the show and the pod, the show and the workshops couldn't coexist. So we've kind of found a way to to let that happen. So I, I just hope, honestly, that some of that guilt, some of that mum guilt. Some of those feelings of am I allowed to feel like this get get eased a little bit and people are a bit kinder to themselves. How about yourself, Em? What would you like? Look, I always want people to feel less alone. I think that that's really important for me. So I'm hoping that by bringing the guests on and hearing, you know, a series of different experiences, takes, thoughts on motherhood will show us how different yet connected we are. But I think the biggest thing for me is I think it can be really, really lonely as a mom, especially early motherhood. But I think also, you know, teenagerhood when you're not connecting with other moms in the playground or playgroups and those sorts of things. So I always just hope that people listen and connect with Mm. something in every mom's story that lets them know that they're not alone in how they feel or what they struggle with. Last question. Jade, would you have any more children? Yeah. I mean, technically at this point, at 34, um, I'd be classed as a geriatric mum. And I know I've still got time, but yeah, 100%. I loved being a mum at those early stages. And I think I said this actually, lockdown really, really highlighted for me how much I did enjoy being a mum because being a working mum, doing a thousand jobs and going to the gym and trying to keep everyone happy and keep the plates juggling, I wasn't as hands-on. And because as she was getting older, she wasn't needing me more. But yeah. being more involved and in getting right down to the nitty gritty and the brass tactics and all those those tiny details, me being responsible for it all again, made me go, oh, this is why I, I, I did really love being this. The world needs more of me. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with that one. <laughs> Are you okay with me asking you as well, Emily? Yeah, yeah. Would you like more children? God, it's a tricky, it's yes, is my sort of overwhelming answer. I'd never imagined only having one. I was one of two, three years apart, hopefully a boy and a girl, because it's so stereotypical. Um, <laughs> You've really got that picture I've in your really head. I've had of the- that picture in my head. And then I'm a single mom and I don't get that second child three year, you know, three years after Maisie, I was literally living on Lon- in London with a three-year-old totally by myself writing the show, you know, not knowing what was going to happen. And I have tried, I did have um, some fertility treatment two years ago um, and it didn't work. And so it was like, oof, I could have kept going and kept going, but that felt financially, I just wasn't in a position to do that. And now I've kind of hit 45. So if you're a geriatric mother at 34, Jade, I am like the octogenarian mother at 45. And I know it's still probably physically possible you know I remember when Maisie started school there were mums in their 50s and and it is still possible I just don't know how I make it work you know on my own facing fertility treatment you know I I still struggle with my mental health you know after the postnatal depression and and the psychosis that's that's kind of been a knock-on fact that I live with now and I do wonder is it safe for me to do that? Would I go, would I experience the same things again? And is it healthy for me to put myself through a process which could repeatedly fail? It's not like, you know, when you just are with someone and you're young and you're having sex and the more sex you have, the more chances you have. It's much more clinical for me. That that, that, that was exactly what happened to me, by the way, just just for (laughs) clarification. (laughs) Um, No, jokes aside, I, I, I would never do this on my own again. I love Ray with all my heart and soul. And she is every, every, She's a part of me in a way words can't even describe. And Absolutely. Every, every achievement I get doesn't come close to when she does something amazing or even completely mundane for the first time. Yeah. I'm, I can say that hands down. Every, every achievement I've ever got doesn't even come within within realm of Ray like because um, she's dyslexic. And the first time she read a book, like properly on her own that nothing comes close to that for me do you know what I mean and stuff like that but I would never do this on my own again and it shout out to all those people who decide after they've done it once on their own they're going to do it again because there's no way my mental health I think I'd really struggle again yeah and that's kind of what I'm facing and then I also look at Maisie and just think 
She's so gorgeous. You know, um, we've talked about this she before. Looks like, she looks like you. Of course she's gorgeous, Emily oh. Beach. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also, you know, like you said about raised dyslexia, she's like a very anxious child. And when you, I see her do something that overcomes that, I just think, what would it be like to split that attention? And what, you know, she's so wonderful. Maybe I should just be happy enough that I have this amazing, wonderful kid that I love to pieces. And maybe that's, that's enough. As we said earlier, don't forget you can join the club by following us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram by searching Good Enough Mums Club. And we'd also love it if you can hit that subscribe button for the podcast, rate and review wherever you listen. And if you know a mum who'd like this, please tell her about it. If the stories in this podcast connected to you or made you think or even hopefully reassured you that you're doing okay as a mum or you're not alone, you'll absolutely love the episodes we have coming up for you. Thank you so much for listening and um, we'll see you later. Bye. 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 How will I ever be good enough? When will the loneliness fade and will it fade away? Why does it have to be so tough?